mountain Looked all around I couldn't find nobody I went down into the deepest valley Looked all around I couldn't find nobody I went across the deep blue sea I couldn't find no one to compare To your grace, your love and mercy Nobody greater, Lord, nobody greater than you Search all over, I couldn't find nobody I looked high and low, I still couldn't find nobody Lord, there's nobody greater, nobody greater, nobody greater than you. I search all over, Lord, I couldn't find nobody. I looked high and low, still couldn't find nobody. I looked high and low, still couldn't find nobody, nobody greater, nobody greater, Lord, nobody greater than you. I'm just going to say that one more time. Woo! Nobody greater, Lord, there's nobody greater, nobody greater than you. Good morning. Grace and peace to you on this Super Bowl Sunday morning. It's good to be together. Um, I think it's still raining out there, so I'm glad we have a nice roof and um, glad we're together to celebrate Jesus' presence and love among us. If you're watching with us online, we're glad that you're here as well and you feel the movement of the Spirit as we worship together. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand and sing. The song says, I exalt thee, which we do with our Heavenly Father. But since we're all singing it together today, it's gonna to be, we exalt thee.
We exalt you, Lord, on high. You can maybe be seated. It is good to be together on this Lord's Day as we celebrate his love and grace and mercy. I want to remind you about our connection card, which is attached to the bulletin. Please be sure to fill that out. On the back is an opportunity to share prayer concerns or praises. If you check confidential, only our pastors will see that. Otherwise, our elders, deacons, and prayer ministers will pray over those in the coming hours. It is such a great privilege for us to walk with you through times of loneliness and despair and also in times of joy. Um, Online, if you're watching online, you can fill out a connection card as well, as we encourage you to do that. There's a button above the live feed that will come down and allow you to do that. So um, just a few announcements, great things happening in the life of our congregation. Would love for you to mark your calendar for Wednesday, February the 22nd at six o'clock in the sanctuary, Ash Wednesday service. It's the kickoff to our Lenten season. Lent is a, a time set aside to, to pray, to confess our sins, to, to, um, to connect to Jesus in a new way. And we hope that you will do that. Um, we'll do that together, kicking off at, um, kicking off Lent, Ash Wednesday, February 22nd, six o'clock. So please mark your calendars. And today we're really excited about chili. We've got lots of chili, and Jackson is here to tell us a little bit more about chili and how we can actually help people around the world as well. Yeah, so we are right now kind of behind on our chili sales, so make sure you are buying chili out there. All the chili proceeds go to the youth, which is really cool. Um, It helps with Fuge Camp and all those other things during the summer, and so we would really ask you to go ahead and buy your chili and put it in a crock pot, great for a Super Bowl. Other than that, we also have these buckets that will be uh, manned right outside the doors at the end of service, Um, one with the Chiefs and the other with the other team. I don't remember who that was um and put all your money in the chiefs bucket but what all these uh eagles excuse me (laughs) what all this uh money goes to is is all going to help with earthquake relief over in turkey and syria and it's a really cool opportunity to give um and it goes straight to a church over there that um has uh opened their doors for refuge and all those things and so really cool uh but make sure to buy chili and make sure to help out with that Great, thank you, Jackson. Also, a reminder, we're collecting our, um, our baby bottles for Child Pregnancy Center, um, and they go in the basket in the common area, so please don't forget to do that. And right now, I'd like to invite our children to come forward if they brought their 10 cents a meal banks to deposit their money in this box right here. And I wanna tell you adults about our 10 cents a meal offering. Our our, um, ushers will be coming by to collect that. This money is going to go to um, earthquake victim relief. We are so very excited to partner with the Outreach Foundation to help those in need in Syria and in Turkey. So um, ushers, if you could come forward to collect that. Um, If you've been collecting 10 cents a meal per, um, per meal that you eat, it's I, I can't remember. It's like three dollars, but come on, give us twenty. Um, we want to um, we want to help out um, our brothers and sisters in Syria and in Turkey. So please do that. Once the basket has been passed in your row, if you would please stand and greet one another. It's good to be together this morning.
Come on up. Come on up. You did? Okay. So for those of you that are new or visiting, um, I am Hunter. I work with our kids at the church and the preschool, and it's the best job ever. And at 9 and 11 o'clock at our services, kids come up for the children's sermon. We talk for a few minutes, and then we um, go off to children's church during the sermon. And um, come on, Ada, come sit down. Let's see who's a really great listener. Today is such a big day. I, I'm cheering for the Eagles. I hate to say it. Don't tell Joel. I hate the Chiefs. Yeah, I don't want to see the Chiefs win again. I, I mean, I think I'm cheering for the Eagles, although those Eagles fans don't really know how to act right. Um, so, um, listen, we've got a long day ahead of us because we are going to go to Children's Church and we're going to come back here at the end of the sermon. And then at 10 o'clock, we have Sunday school, which is so much fun. And um, then after church today, we got to go home, take a nap, and so we can get ready to watch the Super Bowl, right? Um, yes. So I am so excited um, for the Super Bowl. I love it every year, and I haven't even decided what I'm going to cook yet. So here. Oh, chili. I don't have to cook anything. Listen, people, if you have not bought chili, please do not let us see you leaving here today without a bag of chili. It will make us so sad. We had about 40 teenagers spending the week with Jim and Joel and Jackson um, and me in the kitchen cooking chili and all of the money goes to um, support our kids going to a Christian summer camp that is just such a huge um, faith formation for them. So be generous, um, make a donation, buy chili, and it is really spectacular. You helped, yeah, Ryan helped cook chili all week and you were magnificent. All right, Caleb, come here. So if you are um, new to our church, what you might not know about what we're doing is we are reading through the Bible in 90 days and the grown-ups are reading through the regular Bible and we have a, um, a, ch a children's Bible called the Children's Bible in 365 Days. And if you're reading through that, you should read about four stories a day and it will get you through the Bible in 91.5 days. Well, the grown-ups are going to be reading still in the Old Testament this week, um, and they are reading a, um, a book by the name of Job, right? And um, who has heard about this guy in the Bible named Job? He's in the Old Testament. Um, all right, would you like to tell me a little story about Job? How much do you know? This is Caleb Limer, and Caleb is our resident um, um, theologian, so generally Caleb can tell us all about the Bible. So Job was a wealthy man and he trusted... Talk trust a little bit louder. Job was a wealthy man and he trusted in God, but then one day Satan wanted to test Job. So he, um, he started off by, like, he lost his camels. All of his cattle, right? Yeah. So Job was, like, really wealthy and he loved God and Satan said, well, let's see if you're going to love God when all your stuff goes away, right? Yeah. So he took his camels, he took his cows, he took his sheep, all of it went away, right? Mm -hmm. And did Job still love God? Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. And then what happened to Job's kids? They um, died when, the, like, a sandstorm came and the roof fell down on Exactly them. right. And did he still love God even though those horrible things were happening? Yes. That's right. He still loved God even though he couldn't understand why bad things were happening, right? Well, and guess what? Job's wife said, why in the world are you still loving, G loving God when all these bad things are happening to you? Why are you still faithful to God? And then what happened to Job's skin? It broke out in boils. It broke out in boils and he had to scratch it with pots, right? Oh, it was gross. It was so gross, right? But do you think that made him trust God less? No. He, oh, so what, what's the uh, end of the story with Job? Does it end with the bad news? No. All right, tell us about the good news. Then he gets everything back because Satan gives up. Satan gave up because Satan was like, I guess he is, he does love God, right? He is faithful. And he, he loved God even past having all these good things. He loved him even when God wasn't good to, good to him. And so it's a really great lesson for us, right? Sometimes bad things happen and we don't understand why bad things happen. And we don't understand God's bigger plan. But we are to be faithful, right? And know that God has a plan so much bigger than ours. So I'm going to close this in prayer. What? 
and we're going to go to Children's Church, Jonah. Dear Heavenly Father, all right, pray, show me your praying hands. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for this weather and the rain, Lord, and thank you that we have a warm place to go to church. And thank you that you love us and we are a church family today, Lord. And thank you for teaching us a lesson through Job and that no matter what happens, Lord, you have a plan. And even when bad things happen, we should follow Job and trust in you and love you. In your heavenly name, amen. All right, let's go to Children's Church. Ah, beautiful stuff, beautiful stuff. Okay. Job. We did a great job hearing uh, about Job in the children's time, and I want to be able to share a little bit more with us this morning on Job. So, uh, I think the paging, if you picked up a Bible out there, is page 531. We're going to pick up in the 38th chapter of the book of Job, <clears throat> but I need to give you uh, some context, a little bit more than what we got with our kids um, a, a minute ago. So <clears throat> Job is, uh, by God's own admission, the greatest man in all of the East. Now, it's really interesting that there is no historical dating for Job. There's nothing in the book of Job that gives you an idea of, uh, of context. It's not during a certain period of time. It's a, it's a story that is told mostly in poetry, and it's a story that really is kind of a, it's, it's kind of iconoclastic. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's so much more than, than just a simple story. That's why we talk about it all the time, whether we've grown up in the church or not, or whether we've uh, even read, read the scripture, we just talk about, you know, the patience of Job or, or whatever is there. So Job was, Job was the greatest man in all the East by God's admission. He had 10 children, he had 7,000 sheep, he had 3,000 camels, and he had a uh, thousand oxen. Uh, and uh, he is a man of the deepest faith, as God would say. So one day, <clears throat> sort of in the heavenly realm, uh, someone called Satan, uh, meaning the, the Hebrew meaning accuser, is with God as one of the angels in this, in this particular way the story is told. And um, <clears throat> God says to him, well, what you been doing? He said, well, I've been walking around the earth looking for, you know, stuff and and I'm trying to find, you know, maybe there's somebody that, you know, is, is really faithful and, you know, it's not just after stuff. And so God says, well, what about my, what about my, my guy, uh, Job? He's the greatest man in all the East. He has overwhelming faith. Um, what about him? And, and Satan says, well, yeah, anytime somebody has all that stuff, no wonder they have faith, right? So God says to Job, uh, I mean to Satan, and Satan says to God in this conversation that, uh, God's going to let Satan do, the accuser do, whatever he wants to Job, but he can't take his life. So to begin with, he takes his 7,000 sheep, his 3,000 camels, his 1,000 oxen, he takes all of his worldly possessions, and he's poor. And then a great storm comes when all 10 of his children are together, and they all die. And then after that, <clears throat> these great sores come upon Job from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Uh, so bad are they that Job takes like broken pieces of pottery and scrapes the sores. And it goes on and on and on, and the days turn into weeks, and the weeks turn into months. And uh, finally, um, Job's wife uh, says to Job, why don't you just curse God and die? And then we know Job, Job's response, right? He says uh, in a beautiful passage, he says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And then it continues, and it goes on and on and on and on. And then Job has <clears throat> three friends that show up to him, and they're good friends for a week. Why do I say that? Because they sit with him for a week and they don't say anything. When they start talking, they become a little less than good friends. And we realize that each one of those uh, friends is representing a different kind of philosophy or theological view about, you know, 
why do bad things happen to good people or you know, why, what happens, why does God do what God does? And so they start in this conversation that goes on for 30 some chapters between these three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and, uh, and Job. And then there's another guy that sort of appears, Elihu, who's a young man, and he does the same kind of thing and challenges Job. And they're always telling Job he's done something wrong, he's messed up, or he doesn't believe right correctly, or you know, all that kind of stuff. And so that goes on for chapter after chapter after chapter. And then finally, in the 38th chapter, God speaks to Job. And that's what we're going to come to. But, but I want to tell you a story before that. <clears throat> and you're going to wonder, what in the world does this story have to do with the story of Job? And I'm going to tell you a little bit later. <clears throat> so it's a true story. When I was in seminary, uh, there was a, a really rising star in Old Testament studies, young guy, uh, from Singapore, who just was kind of the rock star. <clears throat> everybody wanted to take his classes, and everybody wanted to be with him, and he had this reputation of inviting students to his house all the time, and it was just, it's just a, you know, just really, just really, really great, interesting guy. So I took a class, <clears throat> and I'm in the class, and I realized that, like, you know, everybody else, I mean, I, like, literally everybody else is invited to his house. I didn't get invited. Um, I raised my hand to, to, to say something in class. I never get called on. I mean, it was just, it was just odd. <clears throat> and it got so odd that I finally decided I was going to go to his study when he had office hours and say, hey, I want to understand. Yeah, so I did. And I, I went in and <clears throat> he said, hello, Mr. Wood. And I said, hi. He didn't ask me how I was. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I said, you know, I just feel like there's something that's not clicking with us. And I just really want to you know, I respect you, and you know, what, is there, is there something I've done? Can I do something differently? And he looked at me, and he says, do you want me to be honest with you? I said, yeah, <clears throat> which is always a mistake, right? <clears throat> Somebody says that. No, I really would prefer you not. Um, he said, well, Mr. Woody says, you know, I'm from Singapore, and you know, in my culture, everything is about face. It's about saving face or losing face. Um, everything in our culture is really shaped in that way. And he said, I'm just going to be completely honest with you, Mr. Wood. I don't like your face. And he says, I've, I've, it worries me. I pray about it. I don't like that. I don't like your face. But I just, when I see you, I don't like your face. So we agreed that we would both pray about it and, you know, see what would happen. Well, in class, nothing changed. Never got invited. So two weeks later, um, <clears throat> I get a call from him in our apartment. And, um, and he says, Mr. Wood, I got great news for you. Come in and meet with me. So I get dressed, run in, go meet with him. He's smiling, happy, greeting me, almost like a hug kind of thing. And I'm like, whoa, what in the world happened? He says, this is an absolutely true story. He says, Mr. Wood, he says, I didn't realize that Cheryl was your wife. <laughs> and he said, I'm gonna, I, I like Cheryl's face. This is absolutely true, absolutely true story. So I like her face, so here's what I have decided to do. Every time I see you, I'm gonna think about Cheryl's face. <laughs> absolutely true story. <clears throat> and I'm like, okay, does this mean I get invited to your house and then I get, and I got an A in the class. <clears throat> so, so here's the, so what in the world does that have to do with Job? Okay, by the 38th chapter of the book of Job, uh, Dorothy Hood helped me with this in staff worship this week. In the 38th chapter of the book of Job, he has lost everything. He's lost family. He's lost his possessions. He's lived in his own um, unearned pain for months and months. He is at the limit. He reaches a point right before this in the 37th chapter where he doesn't curse God, but he finally says, I wish that I had never been born. Job had lost his face. All the things that, that earned him that reputation of being the greatest man in the East. He's not an Israelite, by the way. So it, he lives in a place, probably Saudi Arabia, maybe Syria. He's, he's the greatest man in the East, and yet he's lost everything. And, he, and he's had these friends who've told him where he's messed up and, and, and where he's misunderstood and where he's wrong. And, and he's had all this kind of stuff go on. And he is at the place where he has, he has reached his limit. Now, let me stop and say this. This is where I think we mess up with the book of Job. 
and I really mean this, I think we mess up over and over and over because we are told very often that Job is a theodicy, meaning it's a, it's a story about, well, how does a loving God allow bad things to happen? Or <clears throat> more personally, why do good people suffer? And so we look at Job and we're trying to find these kinds of answers that are in it. And I would say to you that that's completely wrong. I do not think that that's Job's intent at all. I don't think it is to talk about why, how, to, how does a loving God allow, <clears throat> I don't think it's to talk about why do good people suffer. I think that Job has a deeper question, a much more important question, and it's this, what's left when you've lost your face? What's left when you've reached your limit? When you say, I wish I had never been born, when you have, you have gone as far as you can gone and you cannot imagine going any farther, <clears throat> what's, what's left when you've lost your face. And so then God speaks. And so it's really intriguing, right? So I'm gonna pick up in chapter 38. <clears throat> God does this for four chapters. I'm only gonna read the beginning part of 38 for us. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. And God said to Job, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Now, this is the man who's reached his limit. He just doesn't want to be alive. He's the greatest man in the East. He's the one that God has celebrated to the accuser and said, what about him? He would never crack. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man, and I'll question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you? When I laid the earth's foundation, tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? On, or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. It features stand out like those of a garment, the wicked are denied their light and their unpraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked to the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths of their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Have you seen the storehouses of the hail? And he goes on and on and on and on and on. <clears throat> and here's the thing. Job has reached his limit. And God responds in this way. Now, we can interpret this one of two things, right? So we can look at this and we can say, here's what God's doing. God is saying to Job, buck up, buckaroo. Who are you to challenge me? And many people do, and many theologies are built on this, and many studies say this. It's about God saying, who are you? How could you challenge me? Who are you to challenge me? Putting us put Job in his place. <clears throat> I think that absolutely misses the point. I think instead what God is saying is this. Job, you may have reached your limit, but I haven't reached mine. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimension? Surely you know. Have you given orders to the morning? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? What God is saying to Job, I think, is this. You may think you've reached your limit, but I haven't reached mine. I think he's saying to Job, I am. <clears throat> now, go back to the burning bush with Moses and you remember what happens? The bush is burning, it's not consumed, and it's God speaking out of the bush, and 
And God says to Moses, I want you to go back to, to Egypt and set your people free. And Moses is trying to find a reason not to go. And he says, well, how, 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 I mean, if I go, they don't even know who you are. Who would I say you are? And you remember what God says? God says, I am who I am, Yahweh, and the most holy name for God. I am who I am. That's all that's needed. And I think that that's what God is saying to Job. I am is all that's needed, Job. You see, every time we try to use this as a theodicy and come up with a reason for, um, for, for, for why this happened or, or to try to get God off the hook as a loving God and there's still there's pain in the world, every time we come up with that, there's, you can answer it one way and then there's still going to be another question and another question and another question and another question. There's always going to be, it's never going to be reconciled. It's never going to make perfect sense. And God is saying, that's my point. I am is all that's needed. Now here's our dilemma. This is our dilemma. We have a choice between two things. And listen carefully, because this is absolutely critical, I think. We have a choice between two things. We can have the gifts of God, <clears throat> the things that God does for us, right? Um, our salvation, our, um, our wellness, our healing, opening the right door for us to, to the right job, or the right relationship, all those kinds of things, the amazing gifts that, that God provides for us. And they're, and they're beautiful and they're powerful and they're important. But if we're not careful over time, then it becomes really, that becomes really the choice is the gifts of God. Um, I, had a, <clears throat> I had an Uncle David when I was a kid, and Uncle David was a ra uh, rascal. Uh, he was in the Merchant Marine, and um, any time he would, uh, this was back in the telegram days, he would telegram tell my mom that he was going to stop by and visit. My mom would cringe because she never knew how he was going to show up. But I was always excited because every time he showed up, he had a big present. It's like I got walkie-talkies as a six-year-old. I got like, I mean, all this kind of stuff. He'd always come with, this really, with these really big presents until he didn't. And he just showed up with just himself. And Uncle David became, became my less than favorite uncle when he came up with nothing right. I mean, are we together? I mean, this is what we do with God so very often as we think about, oh, look at what he's done for me. The Lord's blessed me. He's healed me. The Lord has, the Lord has set me free. The Lord has released him. And those are beautiful things. But are we after the gifts of thing or the gifts of God or are we after God? And that's the question that is posed to Job in the experience of his life. Job, are you believing and trusting? Are you the greatest man in the East because of the things I've done for you, the things I've given you, the things that God has blessed? That's why your faith is there? Or, or are, you, are you after me? And in which case, if you're after me, you're going to have to lose your identity. You have to lose your face. So this, this goes on for, for chapter 38 and chapter 39. And then in verse 40, after God keeps piling it on, Job finally speaks. And, and listen to what he says. Job says, I'm unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. He's, he's getting it, right? This is what God says. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I'll question you and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like, God, like God's and you can, your voice can sound like thunder like his? I mean, he goes on for another two chapters just berating him again or it's seemingly doing so. He's just laying it into him and laying it into him and laying it into him. And I think it comes back to this. Would you condemn me to justify yourself? And so then another two chapters, and then finally at chapter 42, Job replies again, and now Job says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is that, this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I didn't understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, 
but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, Job is there. Now, Job's there. So here's the thing. Almost always, maybe always, we choose the gifts over God. Even the question, <clears throat> if you died today, do you know you'd go to heaven or hell? I mean, there's something in that, right? What's in it for me, my, my salvation? We celebrate when God provides healing in our families. We celebrate when God, we celebrate, we, we, and, 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 and over time, the celebrations become less than celebration, but become expectations, and then they become what we pursue we pursue the gifts of God because he's such a gracious God, because he provides so much. Just like my Uncle David, he just keeps giving and giving and giving, and he doesn't stop giving and he keeps giving, and so it's so very hard to separate him from what he does for us. And so who are we? How do we ever know what we truly believe? How do we ever know in whom we truly trust outside of the gifts that he gives us? We don't. We have no idea. But thanks be to God, there is one who chooses for us. In Deuteronomy at the end, Moses realizes he's not going to enter into the promised land. Um, you know, it's <clears throat> not for him. And so he empowers Joshua, one of the two young men, Joshua and Caleb, Caleb that are still alive. He empowers him to, to lead the people. And he says this to, to Joshua. He says, be strong and courageous. This is in the 31st chapter of Deuteronomy. Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them, and you must divide it amongst them and their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. The Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. And then when we get to the New Testament, we have a new Joshua. You know, y'all realize that, right? Jesus' name is Joshua. It's just the Aramaic, right? So his name is Joshua. And when, and when Jesus comes, you remember what he says, the very last words in the Gospel of Matthew. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. We read this when we baptize. And he ends it by saying, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Thanks be that there is one who chooses for us. Everything about the life and the death and the resurrection and the promise of coming again is about this. It is about Jesus absorbing our inability to choose God. Everything about him is about our inability to choose God for who God is, not the gifts of God. And so he chooses in the midst of his pain, in the midst of his rejection, in the midst of his humiliation, in his execution, in his public humiliation, all of that, in all that he's done, he's absorbed all of that. He's absorbed our inability, and he now chooses for us. And so now we no longer have a what-if story, kind of like Job is a what-if story. What if this happened? What if this happened to you? How would you do it? All that. What are these philosophies? All of that. It's no longer a what-if story. Now it's a concrete reality. When we reach our limit, he goes on. He goes ahead of us. He goes before us, behind us, above us, beneath us. He protects us, and he leads us no matter where we go. That's what we say when we say he's God Emmanuel, simply meaning Emmanuel, God with us in and through all things. There is no place now where you can go where you are alone. He has been there before you. He has been there, and he has prevailed, and he has borne our inabilities to choose. He has borne our sins. He's borne all of that. Now, we know when we reach our limit, he goes on. And this is the power of the gospel, my friends. We no longer have to ask these kinds of questions that the theologians so often want to pose or the philosophers or all those kinds of things. We don't have to ask that because now the deepest question is answered. What's left when you've reached your limit? God. 
and God and God. And we know where he is leading us. And so now, listen carefully. Now, when he looks upon you, when you've reached your limit, when you wish you had not even been born, when you have come one inch from even cursing him, when you have reached your limit and he looks upon you, he sees only the face of his son, Jesus. Paul puts it this way as he writes a letter to the Corinthians, his second letter. He says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For, for this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory because we look not to the things that can be seen, but to the things that cannot be seen. The things that are seen are temporary. The things that cannot be seen are eternal. For we have a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is what we have. He chose for us. And no matter where you go, no matter what you experience, no matter how painful it may be, no matter how depressed you may feel, no matter how sinful you may feel as if you are, there is no place you can be where you are alone. He is with you. And he has gone beyond your limit. And he has said to us, beyond that limit is something beautiful and glorious, though we cannot see it. But we don't look at the things that are seen now. We look at the things that are unseen, the promises of him and his presence and his love and his grace. Let me part with this, this one poke in you. You want to know whether you... You want to know whether you... Um, you're choosing God or the gifts of God? Let me give you a little test. There's other tests. This is just one. When's the last time you prayed this? God, Father, Jesus, Spirit, however you want to start. How's your day been? Oh, I know you must mourn and lament. 28,000 people who've died in an earthquake and all those whose lives will be shaped and changed forever. How are you? Amen. Amen. Not, okay, I'm going to ask you that, but then I got a couple of things I want. When's the last time we, if ever, have sought a relationship with him simply as a relationship? Not for the walkie-talkies, not for all the prizes. Let me tell you, my friends, the other stuff's already decided. We have a house prepared not with hands eternal in the heavens. That's all decided. But if you want to have joy right now, true joy, if you want to have peace, happiness, all of that, simply claim God for God. Not for what he gives you. And when you can't do it, thank Jesus for deciding for you. Amen. Amen. It is so good to be together as we reflect on God's word to us today. Um, ushers are going to be coming forward to collect our morning offering. We encourage you to 
place your tithes and additional offerings in the basket as it comes by and also place your connection card in there as well. If you're watching online, you can participate in the offering, offering as well um, by clicking on the button above the live feed that says give. Click on that button, it will walk you through the giving process. We also have text to give that anyone can use, and that number is 757-530-5683. Type in the word give, the amount you'd like to give, and it will walk you through the giving process as well. So as our ushers come forward to collect our offering, I um, want to lift up some, some prayers uh, that, that we want to hold in our hearts. And so many of these prayers are, Lord, we've reached our limit. Um, prayers for Syria and Turkey in the aftermath of the devastating earthquake. We're so, we're so privileged to have our 10 cents a meal um, go for relief for our brothers and sisters there and also the Super Bowl um, offering as well. So vote for your favorite team and we'll, we'll all be winners as this money goes to um, relief from the earthquake. We wanna to continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, solutions for violence and racism in our nation, uh, prayers for those experiencing homelessness in our region and prayers for the Crisis Pregnancy Center as they support mothers and their children. We're so glad to have so much chili, and y'all, I ordered some, but if y'all don't, if y'all don't buy it, I'm buying more, and I'm stocking my freezer. This stuff is so good, and it smelled so good all week long. I've been, I just can't wait till the Super Bowl so I can eat chili. <laughs> Go team. Go chili. Yay, Jim, and all the youth that helped with that. So we're um, just so excited to have that um, privilege. And then all the money that's raised goes directly to our youth ministry. We're all winners today. Um, we want to continue to pray for those who are fighting cancer, those who are experiencing great loss, uh, for Chris McKinnon-Hing and Nancy McGee. And also a huge opportunity for us next week. So our own Joel Phillips is going to be ordained um, here on Sunday morning at the 11 o'clock service. And we'd love for you guys to double dip, come here at nine and then go there at 11. We're so excited that he's gonna be ordained and um, uh, be a covenant pastor here at First Presbyterian to continue the ministry that God is calling him to. It's gonna be a great, great uh, worship service as we uh, invite the Holy Spirit to set him apart. So please come and be a part of that. If you can't be there, um, send him a card, shoot, shoot him an email, pray over him. Um, we're also excited that uh, Reverend Jim Gates, who was an associate pastor here years ago, he left in 2015. He's, the, he's now the pastor of Covenant Community Presbyterian Church in Wisconsin. He's gonna be preaching at all three services. So it's gonna be a big celebration day just like today is, so um, please just put your party hat on. It's going to be great. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, we praise you, we, we love you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have absorbed everything that separates us from our loving Father. Lord Jesus, we, we choose you. We choose you in all the answers to our prayers. We choose you in, to, in all the solutions in our community, in our world. Overwhelm us, Lord, with your spirit, with sighs too deep for words. Manipulate our prayers in such a way that they completely agree with your heart. We lift our voices to you, Lord, and pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and worship. Splendor of a king Open as you see Let all the earth rejoice Let all the earth rejoice Oh, he wraps himself in life Oh, 
get, make sure I'm on. If you're worshiping with us for the first time, we've got a gift for you. It's a little book by Rick Warren called What on Earth Am I Here For? It's about purpose in life. It's great, it's short, it's free. You don't have to sign anything or shake a hand. Just when you go through the doors, as you're working your way to buy chili, that way you'll see a big table there. Uh, uh, just take, take a book. We'd love for you to take it and, um, and see what the Lord does for you in it. If you want to hold up something in prayer, come on up. Our prayer team's been praying for us throughout this service. They'll be at the front and uh, give them the gift. Hold up anything you want in prayer. And so here's the truth, my friends. Um, at the end of every question is another question. That's just the way it is. And it's good to have questions, and it's good to be in them. But there's always going to be another and another and another. And here's the thing. No matter where, at the other end of the question or at the end of your limit, there's always going to be God. That's what we proclaim. That's his promise. That's his assurance. And that's why we trust and believe. That's why we are who we are. And so let's go out into the world and let us proclaim that to the world, that there is no place we can be there is no place where someone who trusts and believes in him can be where they are separated from his love and his presence. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. God that we serve. Amen. <laughs>